You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Um, hi, good morning, Grace Community. My name is Pamela, and I'll be reading to us um, from 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1, all the way to chapter 20, verse 42, but the shortened version. <laughs> okay, verse 1. Saul spoke to Jonathan that they should kill David, but Jonathan delighted in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. I will speak to my father about you. And uh, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you. For he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, David shall not be put to death. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. Then a harmful spirit came upon Saul, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he eluded Saul, so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled. Then David said before Jonathan, What is my sin before your father, that he seeks my life? And Jonathan said to David, You shall not die. Why should my father hide this from me? David vowed again, Your father knows that I have found favor in your eyes, and he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should sit at the table with the king. But let me go. If your father misses me, then say, David earnestly asks leave of me to run to Bethlehem. If he says, good, it will be well. But if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant. For you, Jonathan, have brought me into a covenant of the Lord with you. And Jonathan said to David, When I sound out my father, should it please my father to do you harm, I will disclose it to you, that you may go in safety. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever, when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth." And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And and Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. Saul said to Jonathan, Why has not David come to the meal? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. Jonathan and David kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. Because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. These are the true words of our living God. Thank you so much, Pam. That was uh, a long reading and well well handled. Well, good morning to you all. It's lovely uh, to see you all. you know, all along I thought um, there was low, uh, low level applause as I was preaching, but then I discovered it was just the noise from the crash. Uh, 
which has been moved. Um, thank you, Lydia, for that announcement. Uh, it's so wonderful that um, we are inundated with children. Uh, children have a very special place in God's heart. Uh, Jesus, of course, said, let the kids come to him. So they are most welcome. Okay, so we are continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And some of the questions I want us to answer today are, first of all, what's going on in 1 Samuel? Just a big sweep of the whole book. Then we're going to ask the question, what's actually going on in this story? And then we can actually expand both of those and say, what's going on in the Bible? How does this passage, this story, actually fit in with the overall uh, big themes of the Scripture? Well, I can answer my first question quickly to say, what's going on in 1 Samuel? I can answer it in a sentence. God is raising up a true king despite sinful opposition. This is the, the, one, the big theme of the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. They are read as a composite. God is raising up a true king, and this true king is David. We knew that in chapter 16. David is chosen as God's true king, and he is being raised up. It's taking us a while. David is going to go through a lot of suffering and struggles, but he has been earmarked as the true king who is going to be brought to the throne. But in the process, there's a lot of sinful opposition including but not limited to Saul, who God has rejected as the king. David is the true king who's chosen the king-elect. Saul is the rejected king and, is, as we see, is providing a lot of opposition to God raising up David as the king. Okay, so that's the big idea of uh, the book of 1 Samuel. If we zoom in on this passage today, which is our, our uh, agenda and focus for today, what is the big idea in this passage? Well, I'll try and put it to you in one sentence again. The big idea in this passage, I think, what is the writer getting at? What is he wanting us to take away and ponder on for the rest of this week? It's this idea. Recognize God's true king and reject God's rejected king. Recognize God's true king and reject God's rejected king. But before we get there, I want to tell you a story. It occurred 26 years ago when I was age 21. And uh, just for context, this was before I got to know in a proper way, beautiful Jess. Now, I was in love with a girl called Fiona. She was in my legal studies class, and I had, as a product of a successful strategy, procured her as my study partner. Now, <laughs> there were four problems. Problem number one, I was young and immature. Problem number two, I was full of male hormone chemical. Problem number three, I was neither good looking nor ugly, and I was suffering under the tyranny of the insecurity of feeling like I was average. And problem number four, which was the biggest problem of them all, Fiona wasn't a Christian. Well, one fine day, I was praying. Guess what I was praying about? I can remember the exact location. It was at my friend Mike Batterson's house. I was house-sitting for him at 2 Bergview Road, Hilton, South Africa. And I was reading my Bible, and I came across the passage, and I'm going to put Jesus' words into a modern context, where Jesus says, if you've got an old pair of jeans, which has got a big rip, not a fashionable rip, but you ripped it on a barbed wire fence or something, and you're trying to fix this, and you get a patch of unshrunk cloth, and you put this unshrunk cloth and you sew it onto the jeans, then when that patch shrinks, it's going to rip and make the jeans even worse. Some things are incompatible. They don't go together. It was like Jesus was standing right there next to me at the table. And I felt him say this to me, you got to choose which kingdom you're in. Are you going to be in my kingdom and choose me? Or are you going to be in someone else's kingdom? The choice is yours. Well, when God talks to you like that, that is the end of Fiona. <laughs> so here's a synoptic of where we're going today. Point number one that I want to make. The fallen kingdom can't peacefully coexist with the true kingdom. Point number one, the fallen, the fallen kingdom, the rejected kingdom, cannot peacefully coexist with the true kingdom. Point number two, recognize... God's true king. The fallen kingdom cannot peacefully exist with the true kingdom. Second point, recognize God's true king. And uh, the flip side of that point is point number three, reject the rejected kingdom. Recognize God's true king and then reject the rejected kingdom. So that's where we're going. 
And then after that, I'll try and locate all of this in the big picture of the whole Bible, and then we'll apply it to our lives. Okay, so, Jonathan, point number one, the falling, fallen kingdom cannot peacefully coexist with the true kingdom. So just to remind you, and you may be new here and uh, new to Christianity or exploring it and have no idea what's going on in 1 Samuel, Saul is the king who's rejected. He has a son, Jonathan. David is the appointed king, the chosen king to be, which God has chosen him. And he is in this arrangement called the covenant with Jonathan. And we saw that last week when Trent preached, chapter 18. So David and the son of the rejected king are in this covenant, which is a lifelong pact to love and to be faithful to each other. But put yourself in Jonathan's shoes. Your dad is the king of the land, but your dad has been rejected by God. And you are in a covenant with the true king who's going to come, David. That puts you in a complete conundrum, in a conflict. You're, you're in two kingdoms, as it were. You're in two houses. And you're trying to do your best to be loyal to your dad, but also loyal to God and what God is doing. Just for a moment, try and put yourself in Jonathan's shoes. He's in a tough, tough, tough situation. And he's got to choose. But what he tries to do is he tries to get both of these to become friends. So let's read verse 1 to 5 again. Saul spoke to Jonathan. So this is the dad, the incumbent king, the ruling king, who's got all the machinery and the apparatus of the state who can wipe out anyone whenever he wants. Saul spoke to Jonathan that they should kill David. But Jonathan delighted in David. And this is where the story has got us to. Verse 2, and Jonathan told David. So Jonathan then goes to David. Saul, my dad, seeks to kill you. But then he comes up with a plan. But don't worry, David. I will speak to my dad about you. Verse 4, and Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. See, he's trying to bring these two together. And then he addresses his dad and he says, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because David has not sinned against you. Remember, dad, how he struck down the Philistine. And uh, that's the David and Goliath story. And the Lord, God is on David's side, worked a great salvation for all Israel. Dad, you saw it. And you rejoiced when David wiped out Goliath. Why then are you going to sin against innocent blood? David's done nothing wrong by killing David without cause. So he makes a pitch. He's trying to broker a peace deal between these two. Saul wants to kill David. Saul is rejected. Saul knows God is going to raise up someone who's better than him. We've already covered that ground before. And now... Jonathan is trying to bring these two together. Well, remarkably, Saul has a rational moment. He hasn't had too many rational moments leading up to this. But he gets lucid and he sees some sense for once. And uh, he says to Jonathan, all right, son, I'm going to restore David to the palace. Verse 6, Saul listened to Jonathan. We don't have many references of Saul listening to good advice, but here it is. Saul listened to Jonathan. Saul swore. He doesn't only listen. He swears a covenant. He swears an oath. He swears an oath, correction. He swears an oath. And the oath is this. As the Lord lives. So he's now swearing on God. As the Lord lives, David shall not be put to death. So he's really given an execution order. Now he's rescinded that. He's, he's thrown that one in the bin. And he's written out another one. I swear an oath that David will not be put to death on my watch. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. So the way is clear for the son to bring David into the palace. And he was in his presence as before. Well, you're Jonathan and you're thinking to yourself, Phew, that was close. Finally got these two people talking together again. Remember, Saul was the guy who twice threw a spear at David in the palace to try and kill him. But here they are, coexisting in the palace. However, things are not that simple. Because God's rejected king can't live in harmony with God's true king. And we see this in verse 9. Then a harmful spirit came upon Saul, 
And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he eluded Saul. So, so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled. Okay, word to the wise. If you're ever looking for a darts partner, don't choose Saul. He's thrown three spears, and he's never hit once. <laughs> the point is... He was trying to kill David again, despite the fact that his own son has tried to petition this peace deal, and he's sworn an oath that he wouldn't kill him. But there's a deeper spiritual principle here, which I put like this. Things that are under rejection from God have a natural spiritual hatred toward things that are approved by God. This is just a general principle. Things that are under rejection from God have a spiritual hatred toward things approved by God. There is a spiritual clash going on in the world. And people who don't feel God's approval or acceptance, but to the contrary, know that they're under God's rejection, have a natural anger and animosity to the true things and the good things that God is doing. Things under rejection from God have spiritual hatred toward things approved by God. You may have experienced this in your own life. Okay, big point number two. These two kingdoms can't peacefully coexist. That was point number one. Point number two is, you, when you realize that these two can't get along, you're forced or ushered or hurried into a decision point. And you've got to choose which kingdom are you going to be in? Which kingdom are you going to be loyal to? And uh, point number two is that you should recognize the true king. Well, Jonathan is still in a bit of self-denial about uh, the conflict going on. Because in the next chapter, verse 1 and 2, David said to Jonathan, David's fled the palace, What is my sin before your father, that he seeks my life? And Jonathan said to David, You're not going to die. Why should my father hide this from me? David, Jonathan is like, no, this, this can't be true. I, I got you guys together and you're living together and like you're not coming with, to me with the story that he's trying to kill you. That can't be true. If it was true, he would have told me. So he's still in a bit of denial that these two kingdoms are in conflict. Well, David then has to explain the facts of life. Verse 3, David vowed again, your father knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this lest he be grieved. But truly, Jonathan, I'm telling you, you've got to listen to me. There is but a step between me and death. Wake up, Jonathan. There's a conflict here. And your dad is out to get me. These two things are in conflict. You need to choose. It's amazing that Jonathan came to David in the first place. He's effectively betraying his dad. But now is the moment for him to make a choice. Which one are you going to choose? And so David comes up with a strategy. We won't read all the detail. There's a royal feast coming up. It's a bit of a sacrifice. I'm expected to be there. I'm not going to be there. Jonathan, you go to the feast. If my dad loses it, if he flies into a rage, then we know. Then you will know. And I'm setting this up so that you, Jonathan, will realize that, no, your dad really is out to get me. Reality bit. It was time for Jonathan to choose a side and to make a call. Uh, so Jonathan says this to him in verse 8. And it's in this moment that Jonathan chooses. Okay, I, can't, I can still be in the house of my father. But in terms of first allegiance, in terms of the priority in my heart, it's got to be to God and what God is doing. I'm still going to exist in my dad's house, but in terms of first allegiance, in terms of the highest priority, it's got to be God and his king. And so he's, he comes to that decision in verse 8. Jonathan says to David, deal kindly with me, your servant. Sorry, pardon me. David is saying this, appealing to Jonathan, who's in this covenant with him, saying, Jonathan, let me remind you that your first priority in chapter 18, the chapter before this, you and me swore a covenant to each other, and you said you would be honorable and faithful and loyal to me. Now I'm standing on that. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, verse 8, for you, Jonathan, have brought me, David, into a covenant of the Lord with you. 
The true king is pressing Jonathan to make a decision based on his covenant loyalty, which he's already sworn to the true king. Jonathan agrees to help. Jonathan makes a call in the direction of God. Jonathan reaffirms and reestablishes in his heart that God and his true king are his ultimate and his first priority. And then what Jonathan does is he throws himself at the mercy, at the goodwill, at the strength of this covenant bond that he has with the true king of God. And uh, these are some beautiful words which we read from verse 14 about the benefits. Now that Jonathan's realized, oh wait, I can't be divided. I, can, I have to choose one kingdom and I'm going to choose the kingdom based on this covenant that I'm in. And then he appeals to the benefits of this covenant. In verse 14 he says, if I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord. When you're in a covenant with God's true king, it is built and it is based on the steadfast love of the Lord. This love is so that I may not die. Verse 15, and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. Jonathan is now bringing his whole family into the covenant with David. He's bringing his whole household into the covenant with God's true king, which is based on his steadfast love, which is based on favor and benefit flowing from the king to the subject. And when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, let the steadfast love that you, David, have, the true king has for me, when God starts dealing with the enemies of this covenant, include me as one of your allies. It's very powerful language. Look after my family if I should die. What he's really saying is, your enemies have now become my enemies. When you're in a covenant with the true king, your enemies become his enemies, and his enemies become your enemies. And Jonathan made a covenant, this is verse 16, with the house of David, saying, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. Now bear in mind, who is David's enemy at this point? It's his own father. This is a radical decision point. He's having to choose, which side am I going to be on? But based on the covenant with God's true king, I'm going for you. I'm going for the true king. And this covenant is built on love. It's built on mutual enemies. And it's built on eternal closeness. Verse 17, Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. Verse 23, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. The nature of a covenant with God's true king is that it's an appeal to love. Your enemies become his enemies and vice versa. And number three, it's eternal closeness. And so to put that all together, when you recognize God's true king, because that's our point here, when you are in covenant with him, you get a picture of this, that the true king is rich in love, victorious against his enemies in God's power, and inseparable from those he loves. What's flowing out of this story is a picture that God's true king is rich in love, victorious against enemies, and inseparable from those he loves. All right, Jonathan has now recognized the true king. He has appealed to the covenant bond that he now has with the true king. He has realized these two kingdoms are in conflict. And then point number three is what's left for Jonathan is to reject the rejected kingdom. The kingdom that God has rejected, flips out of the coin, is that Jonathan has to reject that kingdom too. Well, Saul figures out that his own son has betrayed him and is loyal to David, his enemy. Needless to say, Saul throws an absolute frothy. Do you say that in Singapore? A hissy fit, uh, like tantrum, a uh, complete, you know, something that goes on in crash. You know, one of those kind of uh, shouting and screaming. You know, where you need, you know, your insurance to be up to date, that kind of thing. And uh, he has these words which maybe are some of the 
worst words in the Bible, where he yells at his own son and says to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. He's talking about his wife. Just to help you with the family tree there. I mean, this guy, bad news. I mean, he is the ultimate narcissist before it became a popular thing to accuse someone of. He's also a complete promise smasher. You have promise keepers and you have promise smashers. Saul is a promise smasher. Remember at the beginning of the chapter, he was like, I swear to you, oath, promise, I'll never kill David. As he is saying that, he is hurling a spear. He made a promise to his wife. I'll, I assume, okay, I wasn't at the wedding, but I assume when Saul married Mrs. Saul, he was like, love you, love you, I'll be faithful to you, I'll never say anything bad to you, you perverse, rebellious woman. <laughs> this guy, you just can't trust him. Whatever he's promised in the past or vowed is completely unreliable. And then thirdly, okay, so he's breaking his promise, he'll never kill David. He's insulted his wife, and then thirdly, he throws Jonathan under the bus. The cart. Because he says to Jonathan, and this is in uh, verse 33, as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Jonathan, when I die, you are out the will. You think you're getting this kingdom. You think you're the oldest son and you're entitled to this. You think I'm going to die one day? It's not happening. I want every, anyone but you to have the kingdom. This guy is not a good dad. And Jonathan learns that the fallen kingdom, the rejected kingdom, the kingdom which doesn't have God's approval and acceptance, the kingdom which has been shunned by God, even though it may promise you benefits and allegiance and good things, is often not true to its word. And so if you're going to make a deal, you're in a decision point. Are you going to choose the true king and the true kingdom, or are you going to choose the rejected kingdom, the kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of the world? The kingdom of the world is going to seduce you and promise you and give you all these undertakings. But when the moment comes, it's going to fail you. That's the moral of the story here. And Jonathan realizes, gosh, my dad hates my wife, my mom. Dad hates me. Dad hates my best friend. Dad is only in it for himself. Dad is only in it for himself. Dad is building his own kingdom here. God is not blessing it. God is not pleased with him. Dad, despite that, is literally hell-bent to build his own kingdom and make everything and everyone revolve around him and his needs and his desires. And we are all just pawns. If you sell out to the wrong kingdom, it's going to come back to bite you. The principle, I think, is this. It gives us a definition or an understanding of sin. Sin... If you want to really want to get to the essence or the nub of what sin is, sin is making, then defending your own kingdom, even if it means hurting others. Sin is making and then having to defend what you've made, which is your own kingdom. It's not God's kingdom. He's off the throne. You put yourself on your throne in your little environment, your little home, your little office, your little whatever it is, and you'll defend it, even if it means hurting others. Well, as the story goes, Jonathan rejects the king, the rejected king, and finds comfort in the true king. This is uh, beautifully put in verse 41. Jonathan flees to David, the true king, to be in this harmony and communion with David. David and Jonathan kissed one another and wept with one another. David weeping the most. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. 
Jonathan makes his choice. David has to flee. Jonathan still has to live in his father's house. But in his heart, he still has to make the true king the true king. Many times we are called to live in the world, but not be of the world. Your job, Christian, is to live in the world, but not to make the world your king or your boss or your governor. It's not to make yourself your king or your boss or your governor. No, you live in the world. You don't opt out of the world and go and live on a mountain somewhere far away from everything. No, you live in the world, but you make the true king the true king. And you reject the rejected king from ruling over you. Okay, how does this story fit into the Bible? That's the next thing we want to look at. Well, all these three points apply to Jesus Christ. We can see him here in this story. Because when Jesus came to earth, one of his central messages was that his kingdom was coming. One of his central messages was, I am the king. And I am bringing my kingdom. And I'm going to take people and I'm going to put them inside me. You can be inside the king. You can be in the king. And when you are in the king, and the king's kingdom is going to come, and he's going to use you to expand his kingdom. But you have to know that the kingdom of Jesus is pushing back against the darkness of the world out there. These kingdoms are in conflict. And you've got a choice. You've got to choose. Are you in the kingdom of Jesus? Fighting for it and advancing it, the kingdom of Christ. Or are you in another kingdom? Don't think you can live in both. Don't think you can have two kings. You can't. You can't have two masters, says Jesus. And Jesus is the inaugurated king. He is the appointed king. He came down and he was appointed as the king. He's not yet ruling completely in the sense that all evil is wiped out and all sin is is gone. That day is coming. Just like David is the appointed king... He's going to sit on the throne in full public view one day. There's there's a parallel with Jesus. He is the king. We know that. He's already ruling. But one day the world is going to end. And he's going to take everyone who's in him into his eternity, where he's going to be the true king reigning over everything. We can see Jesus here. How do you get into his kingdom? Well, because you can't get into his kingdom. Because you're sinful, because you're a rebel, because you've built your own kingdom in opposition to him. But if you accept him, if you receive him, if you take his death as your death, if you take his resurrection as your resurrection, he invites you into himself by faith. That you can be inside the king, that he can save you, that you can change allegiance from the false kings and the rejected kings to him and to his kingdom. He is bringing his kingdom. You need to recognize that he is the true king. You may already be a Christian. You may already, like Jonathan, be in a covenant with the true king in chapter 18. But there are going to come moments when push is going to come to shove. And you're going to be forced to choose. Am I going to sell out on the true king? And make a deal with the rejected king. A king who is not God's true king. Those moments come. They come all the time to us. Are you going to recognize the true king and stand on the covenant, which is built on love and mutual enemies and inseparableness for eternity? Or are you not? Are you going to reject the rejected kingdom? Or are you not? Those in covenant with Christ live in the world under current kings but they bed everything on the true king's love. The bond of this covenant is love. The true king, if you're in covenant with him, is overflowing with great love to you. Can we make Jesus our king? If you're facing some kind of moral dilemma, some juncture, some crossroads, some path, often the thing in question is, is Jesus your true king? And are you going to bet everything on the fact that he loves you and he's got you and that he wants to advance his kingdom through you? Or are you going to be betting on false kingdoms? All right, and then finally, in the last couple of minutes, how can this really apply to your life? Well, the obvious question to pose to you is, are you living with allegiance to two kings simultaneously? 
Are you living with allegiance to two kings simultaneously? Who's the real king of your life in real terms? If someone had to look in, who's the decision maker? Who gets to make all the calls in your life? Is it you? Are you the king of your kingdom? Or is it Jesus? Or are you in this kind of relationship where you're trying to make the two coexist? It's either one or the other. And then, uh, literally a little closer to home, I want to ask you this question, and this one might be sensitive. How's your home? How's your home? Something which naturally comes out of this text of people's homes. In Jonathan's home, there was a dysfunctional father ruling the home. He was violent. And over the years, having spoken to many folk who live in this city, two big themes uh, emerge often when people talk about their home life, in, in, when they speak of it in a negative way. It's not only these two themes, but let's focus on these two because that's where the text leads us today. Often, more than you would think, I hear stories of violence in homes in Singapore. Jonathan lived in such a home where there was physical violence. Now, what I want to say to you is it's a really tough place to be. It's not right. You're being violated. You're being hurt. But there are ways to help. There are ways to help. So I just wanted to throw that out there because some of you might be reading this and all you can see in this passage is a violent home. God wants to help. He wants to help you. He really wants to help you. I didn't want to just overlook that. So part of my duty this morning is to say you, you're also not alone because sadly a lot of people do live in dysfunctional or troubled homes where people are not safe. And so find people you can trust, people who can help. So I just wanted to say that. The second theme, the second theme which I often bump into in hearing folk stories in Singapore about their homes is uh, the complexity of Asian families. Okay, these are not my words, these are someone else's words which I'm using this morning. The complexity of Asian, and I'm, I'm not, this is not on the violence point, we, this is a separate point here. The complexity of Asian families, where I'm told, because I ask questions about these things, there's a lot of pressure, oftentimes, I'm not universalizing this, I'm just in my, this is my anecdotal data sample, okay, so just in my limited exposure. I often hear stories of folks who are under pressure to bear the family name in a certain way. Like Jonathan had to bear the name of Saul and do whatever Saul wanted and live Saul's outcomes through Jonathan. Uh, there's often pressure for children to side with parents. Uh, it's often good and honorable because we must honor our parents, absolutely. No one is undermining that. But it can tilt over the balance, clearly. Uh, people can live under a huge amount of pressure to pursue certain prestigious careers. Uh, all of this can be good. All of this can be positive. There is definitely healthy parental pressure, but there's also unhealthy parental pressure. I'm not saying where you're at. I'm just saying in my experience, these are real things that people face. And I want you to know, based on the story here, that ultimately, at the end of the day, your true king is Jesus. Your true king is Jesus. Your true king is him. He is the one who should set your life. He can use your parents to speak to you, absolutely. But you may also be at a decision point of, am I going to listen to him or am I not? These are very difficult and very complex. I know I'm opening up a can of worms here. But this is a direct application of the text. Always choose Jesus. He is the true king. And you can trust him. You can throw yourself at the love of his covenant. 
that he loves you, that he's good pur- got good purposes for you, that he will defend you against your enemies, that he is close to you, inseparably close to you. And it's the strength of your covenant and your relationship with Jesus that should be primary. When you start with that, it gives you a lot of strength to live in difficult home environments. Look, I'm sure on the whole, most people here are living, have got great homes. It's not universalizing this. But for those of you who are in a tough situation, begin with the love of the covenant that you have in Jesus Christ. And that will give you strength to face the issues of life. Amen. Shall we pray for a moment? You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.